Um, so uh, welcome everyone to Meet Meets, uh, Stathis Arabostathis. And uh, uh, I'm very pleased to have Stathis join us uh, today. I'm going to um, start a little bit by introducing our project and webinar series and then uh, Stathis himself, and then hand the word over to Stathis for his uh, webinar. Usually we have this format, and um, we get the introduction. Stathis is going to speak for about uh, 40 minutes. We're gonna have a little break and then regroup for uh, questions from you. So, um, okay, so what is Meet Meets? Uh, okay. I'm going to share my screen with you. Hope this is visible and play. I think this is a slideshow. So uh, starting with our fabulous uh, jingle. More meat, less meat. Sweet. It will teach you not to bite me. More meat, less meat. So Meet Meets is a webinar organized by the Research Project Mitigation Towards Sustainable Meat Use in Norwegian Food Practices for Climate Mitigation. It's a project funded by the Norwegian Research Council under the program Klimafosk, which is a research... More meat, less meat. meat. Uh, uh, research on uh, climate. So uh, today we have with us Stathis Arabostathis, and uh, he's going to talk uh, about the change of chicken production in Greece. Uh, so how we move from productive to sustainable chicken and the material entanglements and technoscience politics involved in this process after uh, 1950. Um, so a little bit about mitigation. We are a transdisciplinary climate research project. Uh, and uh, we, by transdisciplinary, we mean that we are uh, social scientists, humanities, scholars, and artists, together with actors outside academia. So in farming and the restaurant branch and meat and food provisioning, as well as climate, and communi climate communication and culture. Uh, our our project is structured around the three R's, what we call three R's for sustainable meat use, uh, which are recognizing the animals and people involved in making meat or becoming meat, uh, replacing where possible animal-based protein with plant-based proteins and other alternatives with a lower climate impact and uh, good nutritional um, uh, content and refining how we use meat to avoid waste and malnutrition. So, and to match our uh, wants to our needs. Um, so, if you are following us uh, online and you want to share your impressions about this talk and the webinar series in general, our hashtag for the webinar series is Meat Meets. And you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook for updates and upcoming webinars. So uh, thank you for me for now. Our next webinar is March 29th and I will introduce that uh, in a minute, but I am going to uh, stop my share. And uh, Stathi, I want to actually say a little bit about you before you start speaking. So uh, just a little bit introducing your work and your uh, your sort of, I mean, more sort of the CV <laughs> introduction of you. Um, uh, if that's okay, so just uh, give me a second. Um, uh, Stathis is an associate professor in the history of science and technology, in the history of science and technology and currently working in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the National Kapodistrian, Kapodistrian University of Athens. Uh, he has completed his uh, doctoral research at the University of Oxford and has worked in several national and international research projects in Greece and abroad. Uh, he was a Seeger Fellow at the Seeger Center for Hellenic Studies at Princeton in 2019 and 2016. Um, 
uh, was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship at the Center of Science and Innovation Studies at the Law School of the University of California at Davis. Uh, he has also been a, a Douglas Burr Marconi Fellow at Oxford and awarded several honorary and visiting uh, fellowships in the UK. Uh, so uh, also worth the uh, mention, I, th I think is uh, the uh, award that his book won in 2014, uh, the John Pickstone Book Award from the Brit British Society for the History of Science, um, together with his uh, 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 co-author Graham Gooday for their book, Patently Contestable Electrical Technologies and Inventor Identities on Trial in Britain, uh, published with MIT Press in 2013. So uh, we're very honored to have Stathis here join us and especially uh, lucky that his research uh, from, you know, patenting and innovation is not, is also now including research on agriculture and uh, how technology enters in the making of food and of food animals. So I'm giving the word over to you, Stathi. And uh, yeah, thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Sofia. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, thank you for uh, the invitation. Um, and also, uh, personally, I would like to thank you for all the collaboration that we have the last couple of uh, months, uh, at least uh, a year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, as the title denotes, uh, this is uh, one of my latest uh, research projects. Um, it is uh, uh, on... Uh, uh, the production, the industrialized production uh, of chicken and uh, eggs. Um, it is part uh, of a broader uh, project called CONEF, um, which is uh, which stands for Configuring Environment and Food. And we are studying the role of uh, critical techno-scientific networks in the agri-food sector uh, from 1950 up to the present day. Um, CONEF uh, meant to be, uh, let's say, a historically informed policy uh, project. So it is well rooted in the tra uh, transition studies uh, rather than uh, in conventional um, uh, history of uh, science and technology. Uh, so even today, uh, my presentation will be uh, on um, embedded on, within the context of transition studies. Um, and uh, uh, in CONEF, um, we follow um, emblematic products um, in the Greek agri-food. Uh, we have wheat, we study wheat, uh, olives, oil, uh, olive oil, uh, tomato, uh, chicken, pork, and uh, aquaculture uh, fishes like uh, sea bream and sea bass. So uh, we try to identify the role that uh, innovation, science, technology um, uh, played and the agency of science and technology in configuring uh, entanglements uh, with different uh, systems or with different actors within the system and how uh, science and technology uh, shaped imaginaries and shaped industrial uh, modes of production and uh, practically configured the way that we see and uh, we eat uh, in, in uh, we see food and we eat uh, in, in Greece. And um, uh, the last part of the project is, uh, and this is um, the last year of the project, so uh, we are uh, right at the uh, heart of this uh, last phase. Um, it is uh, uh, a work package that it is uh, focused on uh, the uh, and on understanding stakeholders and working with stakeholders in order to assess uh, sustainable uh, pathways uh, that we have created uh, based on the 
um, study that uh, longitudinal study that we have uh, done for the six products. So uh, today, as the title denotes, uh, it is uh, my talk is on the uh, the move from productive productive to sustainable um, uh, chicken in in Greece. Um, um, the structure of uh, of my just presentation. a note, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Stathi, okay. but if you wanted to share, like, yeah, maybe that's a little bit better because it can be a little bit better on our screen. Like this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The structure of uh, the presentation um, will follow practically the two transitions that I have identified uh, in the poultry industry. Uh, the first trans uh, transition starts from the uh, 1940. Eight to 1989, uh, and it is called the uh, construction of intensive chemicalized production with a focus on the new feedstocks, the breeds, and the new vaccines and antibiotics. And the second tradition, transition of poultry production starts from 1990 to the present day, and uh, it is dubbed as configuring sustainability as a healthy product approach. And we will see how the, the actors uh, understand this notion of sustainability or configure this notion of sustainability. And I will conclude with some uh, general remarks. <clears throat> okay. Um, studying, as I said, in Conef, um, in the, sex, the six to five products, Someone can um, configure a periodization of the Greek agri-food uh, system uh, based on the angle that we look at the agri-food system, which is science and technology, technoscientific, critical technoscientific networks. So um, the first period, um, and this is an overall of the whole agri-food uh, system uh, or regime, if you like, that uh, uh, it is the period from 1920 to 1960, um, which is the period uh, where the system and the actors of the system uh, cope with grand challenges like the migration from minor uh, Asia or World War II uh, by trying to respond using native resources or resources well adapted to local regional climate and ecologies. The second period is the uh, 1920s, uh, 1960 to 1980s, mid 1980s, which is the period that someone can uh, tap as the period of hubris. Uh, so, uh, intensification, mechanization, chemicalization is uh, are the main characteristics. Uh, the third period, uh, from the late 1980s to 2000. Um, is the period where new challenges uh, of production a system configured by environmental concerns. And uh, from 2000 onwards, someone can um, identify a period where uh, a new redefinition or a, a new reconfiguration of the meaning of quality is uh, started to be very prevalent and uh, configures the policies and the practices in the Greek agri-food system. I will come back at the end to compare how uh, chicken, chicken production and that production uh, was, uh, uh, let's say, evolved uh, comparatively to uh, this broader uh, periodization of uh, the overall Greek agri-food system. Um, very briefly to say that uh, I mentioned before that in terms of theoretical approach, my approach is not a conventional historical um, uh, approach. Uh, it is well rooted in the uh, transition studies and uh, more specifically to uh, the work of uh, Frank Hills and uh, uh, Johann Scott, uh, the initiators uh, and uh, the conceptualizers of the multi-level perspective with an emphasis on the regime and the regime making, uh, how systems and socio-technical systems 
uh, are made um, within the context of uh, of uh, pressures from the landscape or internally from the system uh, or pressures from niche innovations that want to substitute or to uh, be integrated in the system. Furthermore, uh, I'm using the concept of socio-technical imaginary as it has been coined by uh, uh, Seyla Zazanov uh, in order to show how um, semantic structures configure the, the social construction of technology, of the technological system, and how uh, the semantic structures configure the policies around uh, the, the modes of production. Within this uh, con uh, context, the processes or the modes of uh, productions emphasis will be given also to uh, the materialities and the material uh, configurations of those um, of those uh, uh, modes of productions. I don't want to give you uh, uh, to spend more time. Uh, on the theoretical approach, we can come back at the Q&A um, uh, Q &A, uh, session. Uh, so um, practically, um, we can identify uh, the transition that I was uh, talking in the start of my talk as a transition from uh, a technological substitution to a transition of the uh, configuration of the pathway. So the first transition, uh, 1948, 19, late 1980s, is a technological substitution where um, uh, we have the substitution from uh, the uh, traditional poultry production to industrialized poultry production, and uh, gills and uh, a shot has been uh, have defined technological the type of technological substitution as the one where niche innovation have developed sufficiently and find their way because the regime is under a lot of pressure or continuous pressure so they can replace or they replace the existing regime while the second uh, period the second uh, transition um, we can identify it as a reconfiguration pathway where innovations uh, evolved within a symbiotic uh, mode of existence. Uh, so uh, they reconfigure the architecture uh, of, of the system, the socio-technical system, without substituting the uh, main, let's say, uh, components of uh, of uh, the uh, of the system <clears throat> as i said the uh, period 1948 to um, uh, 1990 or late in, late 98 uh, is the substitution of traditional poultry production uh, uh, from uh, by the industrial poultry production the traditional poultry production was based on around family organization. Um, it contained practically an average of 50 to 100 uh, chickens uh, by farm and um, an annual production of uh, 70 to 80 eggs per chicken. Um, and it was characterized by fragmented practices and uh, an emphasis uh, and practices around uh, native chicken uh, breeds. The traditional poultry uh, production was well rooted to a circular understanding of the importance of family-based based free range poultry production. Uh, eggs were part of a gift giving economy uh, and also small scale production and uh, small scale family businesses. Uh, were, were the core of this uh, activity. Experts uh, in the late uh, 1930s, they emphasized the value of this traditional poultry production 
um, because they found that it was well embedded in the uh, system and the knowledge base that existed uh, in, in Greece, the knowledge system and the, the, the base of knowledge and of education in Greece, because it was technologically low, of low intensity. Um, it was characterized by ecological uh, balance and uh, it was low cost, lens demanding in space. Um, it demanded uh, very uh, low labor um, and uh, also it was an activity that provided food for rural uh, areas and quality, uh, quality food. <clears throat> I need to stress here that in the late 1930s and also after World War II, there were even <clears throat> uh, experts, veterinaries uh, that really stressed the importance of traditional uh, pu uh, poultry. Um, while in the same uh, time, uh, they emphasize that traditional poultry with the use of uh, science with the use of uh, the uh, breeding uh, of local uh, races, uh, with the use of science for identify the best feedstock can be the way of, of uh, uh, increasing egg and meat production and the way to introduce um, uh, chicken uh, meat into the di uh, diet of the Greek uh, population. Uh, because we need to stress that that was, and I will come back on that, that was a, a big quest uh, for the period after World War II. In the same period, same experts really criticized the industrial production system of eggs and chicken meat as high-risk enterprise, of an enterprise that was knowledge uh, intensive and also it necessitated technical and scientific uh, knowledge as well as capital that really uh, uh, were non-existent in the uh, Greek uh, society. So just after World War II, there was an uh, uh, acknowledgement of the pitfalls of the traditional poultry production, but in the same time, there were there were experts that really promote uh, the um, let's say traditional uh, poultry production, or as it was dubbed uh, by then, extensive poultry production, um, uh, and and not the industrial production. Uh, system. Um, okay. Um, so, how the systematic poultry uh, production, all of the industrial poultry, poultry production, systematic poultry production, and industrial poultry, poultry production is uh, stands for the same. Um, uh, really made its uh, way into the public sphere into the policies and also into uh, the practices of, uh, of uh, farmers. The first was that there were landscape pressures um, and the landscape pressure was uh, uh, World War II and then emphasis on reconstruction and reconstruction that was led by American experts and that really promote this ideal of uh, industrial scale poultry production. So one is this. Uh, so uh, World War II, uh, a pressure that really, uh, um, let's say, plays at an advantage, advantageous um, uh, position, experts, foreign experts, to build uh, a vision about industrialized uh, poultry production. And the second, is cooperatives uh, from farming communities that really started to play a, a role uh, in shaping uh, in shaping uh, public discourse uh, about the importance of uh, industrial poultry production for the um, 
for the increase of the income of uh, the farmers, but also for as a response to the urbanization uh, that existed uh, and emerging Greece in uh, post-war uh, Greece. So um, systematic uh, uh, poultry production was started to be promoted as uh, the modern, the organized, scientific, the scientific mode of production versus the parochial, uh, the uh, practice-based and experiential uh, expertise-based uh, practice that uh, was not, uh, let's say, the, actually did not resonate with the modern way of uh, production in general. And also it was promoted as a, a practice uh, of production that fit together, fitted nicely to the uh, emerging um, uh, movement of cooperatives uh, in rural areas of, uh, of uh, Greece. So um, it was promoted as a system that can, could secure the uh, necessary uh, nutrition for um, urbanites um, and uh, versus the inadequate parochial system uh, of uh, nutrition that uh, the uh, traditional poultry production uh, was uh, 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 suggested. So also experts and also representatives, agents by cooperatives, particularly in the 50s, they started to represent broilers and heads, hens as factories. So we find description about chickens as factories for the transformation of raw materials in valuable industrial products. Uh, and as factories that can produce citizens uh, diets and nutrition. So those started to be very prevalent in the 50s um, uh, discourses around that that really um, uh, emerged around the whole issue of industrial poultry production. Also, around eggs, they started to uh, promote eggs as a complete food, an energy provider, particularly for children and elderly people. Eggs are, were promoted as food supplements for people with health disorders like arthritis and digestive in, uh, uh, disorder. So uh, those discourses and those uh, visions, they started to uh, and representations, they were built, as I said, by cooperatives, representatives of cooperatives, uh, and also by uh, experts like agronomists and veterinaries of uh, the period. <clears throat> In the early uh, period, 19, late 1950s, while those kind of representation existed, the materialization of the first farms of systemic or industrial poultry really reminds the old system. So a hybrid uh, system where, as you can see at the uh, right corner, um, uh, you can see that the barns is, uh, are around uh, the house of the farmer. So the farmer's household is in the center or in one dominant corner and around it, the, uh, the barns uh, were uh, built. So it was very close to uh, or organize the early uh, farms around families again and around um, uh, farmers. They saved also along the uh, uh, the principle of more spacious, the healthier is the barn. So space really matter in the 50s. 
When it started to disappear, it was in the period 1960 to 1974, when in the early 1960s, caging started to, uh, uh, to be established in, uh, in the rearing system of uh, the Greek rearing systems. And they were promoted not only as a way to increase the productivity of hands for egg production, but also as a new industry for uh, manufacturers, for manufacturing uh, cages. And also it was this period, this 14 uh, years, that really uh, we can see and we can uh, pin down a drastic increase in the number of broilers uh, per square meter. It was that period where that congestion was acknowledged as the key factor for the spread of disease. While this was clearly acknowledged by key actors like veterinaries and agronomists, and while this was acknowledged also by the agents, the heads of the cooperatives, <clears throat> around Greece, in the same time, they built a whole narrative about technological fixes. Uh, the same actors, they built uh, narratives about technological fixes, um, like vaccines, uh, better breeds, uh, foreign breeds, and also combined feedstocks. It was in the 1960 that really the state started to be an actor in the making of the industrial poultry production. It was the agricultural bank that uh, started to play a key role in, uh, in the distribution of uh, the vaccines along with the microbiological laboratory of Athens, a state funded laboratory. So really the state started to play a role only after 1960s, while in the 50s, uh, it was more uh, the cooperatives and the independent veterinaries that really, uh, and agronomists that really built uh, all these imaginaries. Um, as I said, in the 60s and 70s, and 70s, yes, we have the uh, socio the emergence and the establishment and the dominance of the socio-technical imaginary of productivity uh, that was shaped around the importance of productive races, the well-designed and controlled hatching, the balanced feedstock, the avoidance of animal stress, and the use of antibiotics. Who built this imaginary? As I said, experts, cooperatives, and the National Poultry Association. How? By advertisement and also, sorry, and also companies that promoted the use of foreign uh, breeds, as well as uh, new emerging companies that produce compound feedstock. Advertisements were very key. Uh, agents of the promotion of this imaginary and also publication of handbooks and guides for farmers, advertisements about uh, the nutritional value of eggs and chicken meat, and uh, also um, discourses about linking community nutritional habit and the educational system as well as the uh, food practices in the army. So though all those, they created a socio-technical imaginary that really legitimized and really directed the whole system towards the uh, more intensification and the uh, chemicalization. So we uh, can uh, see, yes. Just, uh, I was wondering, the National Poultry Association was a publicly funded institution or? No, no, this is a, this is a, a good question, Sophia. This is a, the institution of the 
um, uh, poultry producers. So it was a professional body. Mm -hmm. uh, so promoted the uh, interests of uh, the uh, poultry producers that combined both private uh, actors as well uh, and companies as well as cooperatives. Is that okay? And um, uh, they produce their own uh, journals, scientific and professional journals. And uh, we see here how they depict um, new breeds like the uh, 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 moor males and uh, uh, the, the chesty uh, chicken the, uh, that was promoted as um, a chicken that can pro provide more profit, more productive, uh, and more productive animal, a healthier uh, animal. And it is clearly that how uh, they understood uh, both the healthy uh, chicken, uh, very robust, very powerful, and the linkage to uh, money and uh, the profitability. And the same applies with uh, an advertisement uh, of a highline uh, breed, uh, a very powerful and uh, very uh, productive uh, in terms of uh, egg production uh, breed. So, uh, and, and also vaccines were promoted as technological fixes that, um, that will sort uh, solve all the uh, problems of uh, and this the, the uh, disease this uh, diffusion and disperse of uh, that congestion uh, was uh, creating. Feedstock was a big issue because, as I said, feast, new feedstocks were promoted as uh, science based. Compound feedstocks were promoted as uh, the science-based and evidence-based um, uh, technological solution, as a standardized solution for the uh, quality and also the healthiness of the animals. But also it was promoted as an industrial, new emerging industrial sector were really um, native uh, investors can invest, and also the uh, producers uh, really uh, can have a science-based assistance in order to uh, increase the productivity of their uh, farms. So um, uh, compound uh, feedstocks were uh, promoted as ready-made science-based um, uh, science-based uh, technological fix and uh, their vitamins and antibiotics uh, were promoted as uh, important and appropriate uh, components of those uh, compound uh, compound uh, feedstocks antibiotics in the 1960s up to the 1990s were uh, emerged as substantial, as I said, component of the feedstock within the context of medicalization of this of uh, feedstock as protective measure in order to improve animal growth, in order to improve uh, productivity, and in order to uh, function as nutritional factor uh, and thus as vitamins as they dubbed it. Something that after 1990s really create a lot of pressure in, uh, in the system. But the actors that I described, that means cooperatives, veterinaries, and also uh, industry from feedstock, they created also not only imaginaries about technological fixes, but also they started to create a representation about the appropriate 
consumer. It was in the late 1960s that we can identify translations of surveys from other countries, particularly the United States, that really uh, shows or tried to show that middle class people, they like, um, they don't like thin and white uh, birds because uh, they, uh, they consider as a disease. Um, white skins meant as animal that as an animal that lacked uh, a healthy diet, odorless, uh, odorless,ent tasteless animals, and also uh, all those survey, surveys and translations about surveys they emphasize on the importance of standardization and certification. Uh, although. We have those surveys in translation in the same uh, time um, in the public sphere and particularly towards the, uh, the consumer. Um, nobody mentioned the important problems for the standardization, the certification of the production that uh, producers and farmers were facing in the 70s and in the 1980s. So to go to the second uh, period in the 1990 and 2000 and up to the present day, in the 1990s, we have pressures from the landscape. Uh, and when I say landscape in this uh, outside of the regime, and those pressures have to do with nutritional uh, scandals, but very minimal uh, agency they had on the uh, production. The most important were European, new European legislation about animal well-being and uh, the uh, uh, and the use of uh, antibiotics. The European legislation about uh, cages and uh, also. Um, uh, tensions that existed in relation to uh, red meat. So competition from another system, competition from another uh, market. <clears throat> it is important to understand uh, that the 1999 uh, Council Directive that really introduced the new enriching uh, cage system uh, provided a new pattern of uh, production with new standards uh, that really uh, pushed, at least in terms of legislation, uh, the change from, en from unenriched to enriched casing system. And uh, the directive of 1999 identified that uh, uh, the unenriched rearing system should have been prohibited since the 1st January of 2012. What happened in uh, those 22 years in Greece was almost nothing because uh, there were um, no compliance with the European regulation. There were um, concerns from the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union that suggested the Gre uh, Greece's uh, conviction. And um, egg production units, so farming, uh, big uh, industry resisted to change and to comply with the European uh, legislation. And the reasons uh, of uh, this uh, non-compliance can be identified as the lack of investment money or the ability to secure loans. So uh, we need to think that it was the period of um, the financial crisis. The lack of awareness of animal rights and the impact of animal well-being in the end product. So the impact that the emphasis on the we animal well-being uh, to the consumer. At, this, at that period, there was no such uh, awareness and also the political vested interest and the political culture that prioritize the native vested interest versus the European legislation. 
how the incumbent regime, so the dominant regime, uh, uh, responded to those pressures. They responded by uh, slow, as I said, uh, compliance to the regulation. The second is by uh, pushing and promoting systems of certification of alternative modes of production, but as a way to enhance the commodification and reconfigure the chicken and eggs production and chicken and eggs as commodities. So enhance their uh, portfolio rather than really change the practices and the conceptualization of sustainability. There were early experiments uh, that really started that as experiments. And uh, uh, from the very early uh, days of the uh, mid 1990s, and initially in the egg production uh, uh, system that really made their way as uh, step by step and following a 10 year uh, 10 years of experimentation and it took them so many years because of the entanglement of um, and the uh, dependence in uh, to big uh, breeding companies uh, about the new breeds. So for them, it was very difficult and it took them 10 years to uh, move from a caging system to a free rate system. I'm talking about a farm in, the, in central Greece that now is a big uh, player in the system of egg production, maybe the biggest egg production uh, player, but it took them 10 years of experimentation, of gradual uh, move to free range. And the reason was because of the secrecy in the production of breeds that was for them a big uh, challenge and could not control the uh, process in order to speed the process of uh, transition and uh, change. But also they found that how they could differentiate and how they could uh, shape an identity to their products, it was the feedstocks. And there, through uh, secrecy, and secret recipes that they created. So another round of local secrecy then, they tried to build identities to uh, the new products uh, that uh, uh, they wanted to create uh, through the move from caging to the free range uh, egg uh, production. And this emphasis on, on the feedstock, they were linking uh, the last couple of years, and I'm talking about the same farm uh, and the same uh, indus in, industrial player. Uh, they were talking this emphasis on the feedstocks with the issue of biodiversity and the emphasis of, as I said, placing chicken in the region, not in the production. So emphasis on the geography, emphasis on the use of organic and local herbs and plants for the, uh, for the animal. Uh, and as I said, may, as they said, making hands part of the regional development. This is their vision uh, now for uh, transforming uh, their uh, production. Yet there were other strategies, other strategies by other players and um, that they built on the activities of scientists. 
scientists in labs, particularly the veterinary lab uh, in the veterinary school of Thessaloniki, that really promote an agenda, a research agenda, that started in, in 1994 and lasted until at least 2008, uh, working on creating X, uh, omega-3 X fatty acid X and omega-3 uh, chicken as functional foods by looking at the antioxidant functions of specific plant-based feedstocks and making products with specific characteristics. A product-oriented approach was developed it, uh, in the research agendas of those, uh, those uh, schemes and those labs, and it was translated to the production lines of specific actors, uh, in particularly in the north part of, of Greece. Here we say we see that uh, they developed an omega uh, three uh, chicken that it is uh, 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 its feedstock is based on olive oil. So um, they started to. Uh, shaped an agenda of chicken and eggs as functional food. Mm? This agenda, as I said, was promoted by specific hubs of researchers and research networks uh, in, uh, in Greece as a way to legitimize their agenda and their role within the context of the emerging new entrepreneurial university. So they found a way to play a role within the changing university, while at the same time, they played a role within the production uh, system of the agri-food uh, sector. And this agenda really someone by giving, because I did a lot of interviews with, uh, with the uh, lab and lab members, it lasted until 2008. Since 2008, they started to develop a rather alternative approach. Uh, the leader, uh, Professor Fortomartis, would say that now I intend to create healthy animals, not continuing understanding innovation as a product. We need to transcend the anthropocentric approach. So emphasis is on animal health, not only metrics of growth, but metrics on animal health, but also emphasis on the animal rather than emphasis on meat as functional food and create assets there, uh, not just commodity, while now they start to have a different agenda. This agenda someone can find in terms of discourse and vision, in the early, very early, and very unique case of the creation of a niche market, which is the organic chicken uh, meat that was developed uh, since 2002 by this very unique uh, company um, that was established by experts, agronomists, animal scientists, but with a unique shared vision, which is uh, agroecology. And practically, they started to build a vision around reinventing the traditional chicken that someone could find in the traditional poultry production back to the roots practically, but within the organic practices. I don't want to uh, say more about this because it's a, as I said, it's a unique case of, of experimentation that lasted for several uh, years, again, because they were 
dependent on foreign breeds that now had to reconfigure and reinvent the same breeds because of the different production uh, mode. Yet still, <clears throat> those linkages with conventional uh, companies of conventional uh, breeds are still exist in the uh, organic, in such an organic uh, um, uh, farm, because exactly there is no program of developing organic chicken in, in Greece. So they start with breeds, conventional breeds, and then they try again to differentiate through feedstock and through modes of production and through uh, avoiding uh, vaccination in order to build the identity of uh, the product. These linkages <clears throat> between conventional uh, breeds and the whole or organic, it was deemed as a pitfall. And thus, alternative networks of uh, based on agroecology that uh, wanted to promote a more sustainable meat uh, production um, uh, really shaped or are trying to shape a different pathway. What they are trying to uh, establish is an alternative way of. Uh, production based on alternative practices, re reinvention of traditional um, dietary for animals, and also trying to use modern genetics, as they say, in order to build locally, create local breeds. This is a pilot program based on agroecology uh, values and visions in order to reinvent the domestic, as I say, seeking production. Domestic, not in the way that they create farms within uh, cities. It is, in a way, they promote this agenda of alternative practices, modern genetics, new feedstocks, or old receipts, receipts with uh, using, um, using local uh, herbs, herbs and local uh, feedstock uh, by using a system, and this is uh, very interesting, by using the system of uh, virtual breeder. What is the virtual breeder? Are urbanites that can host chickens, can decide what kind of production line they would like to, uh, let's say, to, to, to have for their chickens remotely survey the chickens where the barn is far away from the urban center. And then practically through this virtual uh, surveillance and through decisions that they made at the distance, practically through virtual witnessing, they uh, create their meat, they create their uh, eggs without being there, but the eggs and the meat, they are uh, transported uh, once uh, they decide uh, when they need it uh, to the consumer. So practically you have through virtual technology, a prosumer, um, uh, through virtual witnessing and through virtual decision making. And this is based 
within the concept of sustainable living and sustainable uh, production, not organic, but sustainable. So a new concept of sustainability that was built in a pilot, admittedly pilot uh, project within that it is built on the values of agroecology, but with an emphasis on the digital uh, technologies. So to conclude, uh, to come back to the um, periodization that I uh, suggested for uh, the big overview that I provided uh, for the uh, Greek agri-food system. Um, if someone compares uh, or if someone wants to place the transition, the transitions that I described uh, in the chicken, uh, in the poultry production, would say that the period of 1920 to 1960 is uh, the period of coexistence of patterns of production, the coexistence of extensive with industrial poultry, sorry, poultry production, and the emergence of chicken as a commodity. And this was linked to the emergence also of the movement of cooperatives. So it was a market and also organizational uh, emergence. The 1960 to 1990, the dominance of the industrial uh, poultry through intensification, mechanization, and chemicalization. So uh, it goes up to 1990 and not in the 1980s as someone can find in other products. And from since the late 1990s up to 2012, someone can identify the period of new challenges for the production system that it is configured by environmental concerns. Uh, so the challenge of mitigating change through standards and certificates, certificates of production and processing. And from 2000 onwards, actually, someone can say from the late, uh, from mid 1990s to the present, where the emphasis is on the redefinition of quality, uh, the emphasis on the acetization of, of agri-food products and uh, new emerging networks of consumers uh, with producers. The first transition <clears throat> uh, that I have described is, and as I said, someone can identify it as a uh, regime sub substitution transition, a transition that question, uh, was questioning the basic assumptions and rules constitutive to incumbent regime, uh, a transition that was based on the modernization and productivity imaginary, on technological fixes, and on an emphasis of cooperatives that as actors who, as actors of civil society, can be both uh, entrepreneurs and also system builders. The second transition is a reconfiguration transition. The uh, it reconfigures the rules and practices going beyond commodities and reconfigures during this tra uh, transition the dominant regime by linking the quest to sustainability with quality and quality certification. Science and researchers are presented and are functioning as asset makers where acetization is part of this second uh, transition. Creating expectations really save the conditions for the emergence of socio-technical imaginaries that legitimize pathways directions. By highlighting, highlighting, and this is something that we have stressed in the first tradition, transition, by highlighting developmental models and narratives which promoted particular practices and technological fixes, steered the agri-food system to more large-scale and industrialized pathways, thus in trajectories 
uh, serve the dominant views. The lack of common agenda provides that we someone can identify in the second period provides opportunity for new collaborations and licenses between regime actors. Universities there, as I said in the second period, played the key role, key knowledge infrastructures in guiding and shaping concepts and practices. And also research is conducted within for many years, particularly 1994 to 2008, within the therapeutic imperative. Uh, in this context, the intermediation, the intermediaries, particularly scientists, are uh, very important, both as asset makers, but also in the first period as uh, guards of the industrial production. Science is affecting the direction of transition, reconfigure the dominant regime by linking the quest of sustainability with quality and quality certification, acetizing food products, and in the uh, last uh, transition, the second uh, transition, the second period, scientists is presented as the entrepreneur. The new emerging uh, uh, vision of compre comprehensive health and emerging agenda uh, that someone can identify within specific scientific hubs promotes also the vision of the responsible scientists, the sentinel scientists. Finally, virtuality and surveillance technologies and innovation, really that someone can find, as I briefly described in pilot uh, uh, initiatives based on the agroecological principle, really promotes the responsible parent and consumer. So really there you have the co-production of sustainability with different identity of, of the uh, producer. And with this, I would like to thank you so much. I hope it was not that tiring. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stathi. And thank you, everyone, for your attention. Usually we have a little break now, but I see we don't have that much time for questions. So I would still like us to have a very short break, just a couple of minutes, if possible, if, uh, and then we are back. Uh, so I will just uh, pause the recording and give you a couple of seconds to gather your thoughts, a couple of minutes, two, three minutes, if you want to fill up your coffee or... Uh, do a bio break and then you know meet here uh for the continuation i'm pausing the recording and i'll ask for your permission again for recording the discussion thank you thanks Stas. this was amazing yes okay thank so you, you so much mm. so uh I'm sorry, I already read out the question to Stathis. Uh, and so, the, yeah, it's a three part question on the basically the role of firms and, and of industrialization, despite this kind of move to sustainable chicken. Um, Sophia, uh, mm -hmm. where is this uh, question? Just out of uh, it's not at the bottom, at the bottom of convenience, that to, to see the yeah, yeah, the at the bottom of the screen, there is this QA, uh, a little image. If you click down from over here, ah, okay, yeah, 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 okay. and yeah. you can Thank click you. QA, yeah. and then you see the last Q is the question, okay, yeah, um, so. Very good questions indeed uh, about uh, firms. In the first uh, transition, what I'm arguing is that uh, the uh, role of uh, firms in, in terms of uh, uh, industrial firms of poultry production uh, was not that active, um, while cooperatives are uh, were more important for sure, and they were more important because uh, there was a uh, um, 
corporatism, a corporatist ethos and corporatist uh, organization of those um, cooperatives. Uh, so, and that was something very important as a characteristics that characteristic that really differentiate, for example, the chicken and deck production from pork pro production, for example. Uh, very little cooperative uh, initiatives there. And that's why very little um, uh, industrialized pork production in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s that really started after the early 70s, the pork production, because exactly of the cooperative, um, cooperative movement found uh, that uh, chicken production can be um, can be promoted through patterns of industrialized production, uh, while in the same time, without the uh, huge investments and the huge loans that uh, uh, financially the uh, pork industry uh, would involve. Uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, presumably uh, the uh, market here was uh, controlled by foreign companies and agents of foreign companies. Uh, so um, they did not play in the first uh, <clears throat> uh, transition um, a direct a, 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 and clearly direct uh, uh, role in shaping the system, uh, but only indirectly, um, particularly after the 1960s, because um, the vaccines uh, uh, distribution and the uh, distribution of medication, other medication, was controlled by the uh, state lab and also by the uh, agricultural bank. Uh, so there you have a regulated system um, uh, that really um, pharmaceuticals directly uh, could not really play a key role. That's why I emphasize on the role of uh, industrial actors from the feedstock industry, because there you have industrial actors, uh, local industrial actors that really promote the use of compound uh, feedstock and the use of antibiotics as vitamins, as uh, supplements. So uh, this was, uh, I think that this, um, this uh, also replies to the second question, uh, because uh, in my talk I have mentioned about the socio-technical imaginaries uh, that uh, was uh, built by, uh, based on uh, foreign models of production, particularly, and also of consumption, particularly the American uh, model. And uh, how the poultry production organized today, I was, uh, presumably, um, uh, Marc Olivier had to live before uh, the uh, developments uh, that I have described about today. Um, the interesting uh, uh, issue uh, that, admittedly, I have not looked in in um, uh, in depth and. Uh, I think that now that uh, uh, Marco Olivier has mentioned, I need to uh, dig more about the green uh, industrialism. This is something that, uh, although I haven't looked, now that Marco Olivier mentioned this, this is really linked to the whole issue of poultry production, sustainable poultry production that it is promoted by incumbent regime actors uh, through certification. Uh, so I think that uh, there is a link there that I'm not ready to um, uh, explore further now, but definitely a very good suggestion and give me uh, a good nudge to go towards that direction and link green industrialism with 
the issue of sustainability and certification issue. I think that I have uh, replied That's to great. all the questions. No, um, yeah, I think Sebastian had to leave, but um, shall we field the uh, questions from other participants? Or I also have a question, but it would be nice to hear from others. If you have a question, just raise your hand. Uh, Kate, yes, please, welcome. Thanks so much. Um, this was such an incredibly rich presentation, and I actually found myself journeying through part of my life history in a totally different part of the world, and the messaging that was taking place at different eras that my mother consumed, and how poultry played a role in our lives. Um, I'm very interested in food security for the future, and I'm curious as to what lessons um, you might think this this large view of these multiple transformations of one food um, might contribute to future imaginaries and how we um, how we move into a, a, a more and more food insecure world. What has worked and what might this mean for um, how we adapt some of those lessons from the poultry industry into our future, whatever the food might be industry? Mm. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for your comments and uh, also for your um, question. That's admittedly a very uh, difficult question. Um, it is something that uh, we are trying, uh, as I said uh, in the initial part of my talk, that we are trying now, now uh, in the project to, let's say, think about ideal or possible pathways uh, based on the uh, based on our longitudinal analysis, but also on uh, stakeholder analysis uh, and views. Uh, I think that the most, something that I, I would like to emphasize is the emphasis, the, the, the importance of visions and expectations and uh, uh, how those visions and ex expectations are uh, converted to imaginary, socio-technical imaginaries. This is something that someone can uh, look at uh, those issues as descriptive in a descriptive manner and the descriptive approach, but they are very performative. So without building visions and imaginaries, it's very difficult to promote alternative pathways. Uh, this is something that I would like to stress and I believe that um, uh, my story uh, can also um, be uh, supported. The second is the role of uh, science, mm -hmm. admittedly or not, um, critically approach uh, or not, uh, was important. Mm -hmm. So um, it is clear that the scientists played also the, uh, there was an identity politics along with the uh, uh, emergence of the uh, science in those two uh, transition from we, we if you like we moved although I simplified from uh, the scientist as a gate gatekeeper of industrial production secure industrial production and also gatekeeper of uh, let's say urbanite life by providing nutrition and stuff like that to the uh, sentinel uh, expert, which can be an entrepreneur, but also it can provide functional uh, food. So if we cannot integrate scientists within the alternative uh, pathways, I believe that um, they will be very thin. What kind of science that is a matter of uh, deliberation. Mm -hmm. What kind of scientists, it is a matter that it will be emerged through deliberation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I hope I have uh, somehow replied to you. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for the question. This is great. I see, I mean, we are officially ending up but if people want to keep uh, to 
keep <laughs> listening to this, uh, please. Uh, that will be wonderful. I, as I was uh, listening to you uh, both discuss this, I, I mean, I had a question, a, a couple, a question about gender and about traditional knowledge in this uh, context. So um, we see also in in Norway that there is a kind of with the transition to industrial production, there is a kind of masculinization of farm labor. So a lot of the, the home farming or the farming uh, done around the house in this first earlier domestic model uh, was uh, work done by women. And I want, and, and in the transition to a kind of industrial intensive system, uh, what it, we also see is a shift in these gender roles uh, around uh, food production. So I was wondering if you see something similar happen in Greece. And the second also question had to do connecting a lot to what you were saying about scientific knowledge. And I really was so interested in the, I can see we had, we've had a conversation also about this before, and I can see how compelling this uh, in the kind of innovation around eggs is uh, here and um, the kind of vision of these scientists and their experimentation with feeding different herbs. And But I was wondering, um, is this experimentation informed by, because you talked about local knowledge and local practices, would that mean like traditional knowledge or sort of lay knowledge that exists within the farming community outside of the science, sort of the science establishment or science expertise? Do you see this type of traffic going on here as well? So those were my two uh, questions. Thank you. Again, it was fascinating and very rich. As, uh, Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sophia. Mm -hmm. uh, about the Muscula, masculinization uh, of uh, the farm production. Um, I, I haven't found something. Uh, and because uh, I, I based the initial the analysis and the study of the uh, initial um, the, the, the first transition on archival work, while the second tradi uh, transition is based on oral histories. And so the first trans transition, I haven't identified something like that about the production. You have issues of gender and gender representation and roles uh, within the context of all this I, I mentioned before the translation of surveys mm -hmm. about uh, the uh, consumer uh, consumer patterns. And there, presumably, you have the representation of the uh, female who is the uh, guard and works in the household and all this um, repertoire uh, that really uh, was very prevalent in the service. Mm -hmm. So practically reproduced this issue of an urbanite uh, woman who is not really a working woman, but it is uh, above and beyond all a, uh, let's say, uh, a, chef, a cook and also a mother. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I haven't found anything about production. Production was based on really uh, male uh, actors, and um, without having this as the key research question, but unavoidably by looking at all these um, uh, advertisements, all these uh, translations, the pamphlets uh, of particularly the the first period, mm -hmm. someone. It is clear that uh, it is impossible to find even a female uh, researcher <laughs> up to the uh, late uh, 80s mm -hmm. uh, in relation to uh, poultry production. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, but, but, but I need to, to stress that uh, if someone having this research question 
conducted, let's say, oral histories, maybe then you have a different approach. So uh, that's why, but in the archives, it is not, uh, cannot find this transformation that you have described. Mm -hmm. Maybe in, in other products, but definitely not in, in poultry uh, production. Mm -hmm. um, in relation to uh, the, the science and versus uh, local knowledge, um, there is, at least from my point of view, and looking at the networks that I have interviewed for uh, the later period, and looking at the archives of the first period, um, the issue at stake, uh, there was no tension between both. Um, practically, <clears throat> local knowledge in the first period was linked only to surveillance practices of the farmer, mm. not to different ways of producing, not to different feedstocks. Mm. So surveying the uh, farm, su surveying the production, in a way securing the biosafety of the coop was part of this knowledge of the farmer, of the breeder who uh, really knows his uh, uh, the coop. So that was the only, and this is uh, something that uh, continues. The, the important is that uh, issues is that scientists in the second uh, transition, they reinvent uh, local, not knowledge, but local products, not local uh, uh, plants as part of the diet of the animals. And they play their role there and they play the agenda of biodiversity. The important issue is, um, and this is something that we are working on in the project, is whether by this discourse, this linkage of a scientific, a new scientific uh, way of production, and thus uh, the creation of assets and the process of assetization in order to create niche markets, and the linkage of this product with the discourse of biodiversity, huh? you forget the issue of sustainability and sustainable production of all those plants. So maybe you have hidden their unsustainable ways of production of all these plants. Mm -hmm. uh, while in the same uh, time you play the uh, agenda of uh, the card of uh, biodiversity. I don't know if you cut my point. Yeah, yeah, I do. It's kind of still uh, in, maybe that connects to this green uh, sustainability or, sorry, uh, green uh, industrialism. Industrialism, yeah, yeah. I need to, to think about that. And also I need to, 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 to work a little bit on that because it is a very good uh, um, suggestion. What about uh, other uh, questions uh, or should we wrap up? Do we have other comments? I uh, well, have more questions, but <laughs> I'd rather others get to speak. Um, No. So, uh, well, oh. yeah, you have a question, Kate? Actually, it's not me. I, I don't know if Emma's question was addressed in the Q&A. Uh, there, there uh, yes, I see it here. Yes. Uh, I'm, I am sort of here. I yeah, here. so maybe you can uh, turn on the... Yeah, yeah. I'm just, um, on, I'm just on the move. Okay, so, no worries. Know. If you want to ask the question or... Um, I think, uh, read it. I mean, it's just this, I'm really fascinated by this acidization, mm. and it seems that 
uh, you know, it's this whole issue of how that the relationship between what you're saying, the science and the economy, but also the to create a type of agriculture that keeps needing more inputs. So it's kind of this question: How are there any? Is there any evidence of kind of responsible science, which actually kind of works within a kind of a degrowth economy? <laughs> I guess that's the ultimate question, really, isn't it? And I guess regen agriculture is one example of that, but it doesn't have this big scientific investment in it and probably doesn't need it in quite the same way either mm -hmm. yeah so it's kind of thinking you you could see only oh no, one vision would be to try and you know create some way of engaging scientists and funders in thinking that there's certain types of research that shouldn't be funded that basically just perpetuates the making of more products because i can't quite see how the making of more you know additional like the antibiotics, the fertilizers, the specialized feed, you know, all these things just wrapping up into more and more of kind of economic activity, which doesn't necessarily deal with the crisis. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Emma, for your question. If I got it uh, rightly, I think that um, at least for the second uh, transition, um, if you, uh, apart from the last pilot project that I have studied of urban poultry production, uh, that it is based and initiated, initiated from ag agroecological visions and initiatives, all the others uh, scientific, networks and also enactments uh, they were within the context completely of uh, and straightforwardly of building assets of creating new niche markets and practically there is a dominant discourse and this was really prevalent in the stakeholder meeting that we have uh, done uh, in late uh, January that a lot of the farmers and also of uh, the scientists, they really play the card of science that uh, create added value. Mm. So assetize the Greek products in the global market. So that is the discourse that they develop, that it is also associated, that it is built with uh, a central uh, state uh, politics and policies in a socio-technical imaginary that really is um, is bought by farmers and um, the whole issue of responsibility mm, and the whole issue that I, I talk about the sentinel expert it is linked to this kind of responsibility, responsibility uh, towards the sustainability as in financial sustainability of the uh, of the mode of the production mode. Uh, so, um, or a responsibility um, towards my country, as they said, the scientists, in order to secure the value in the global market. So the identity, the product identity with the value it went hand in hand with the agency and the uh, enactment of science. So uh, no really emphasis on uh, degrowth and uh, the whole issue of uh, alternative uh, economic patterns. So at least so far as I have seen. What even about, hmm. even the organic poultry that I mentioned that I have studied very uh, deeply because it's a very interesting case, particularly because of the experimentation to bring uh, to 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 bring the uh, chicken out of the barn to uh, the uh, open space, and they are. Um, uh, from the interviews, I was really surprised seeing how much experimentation and uh, 
uh, experiential expertise was involved, but always with a feedback loop to the big breeders in France, in America, in order to create the new breeds for them. So there was an entanglement there and a strong entanglement. And even that initiative, and I stress that initiative because it was the only organic uh, uh, chicken production and egg production uh, for many years in Greece. Now they have the 80% of the market. They have a horizontal production, a vertical production. So they produce the feedstocks, uh, everything. And they were thinking about exports. So you see, they did not, they were integrated and I, I dubbed them as niche regime. So they are small, but they have um, adapted and well acclimatized in the uh, rules and patterns of the regime. I don't know if I have answered the question. I believe that, or at least I tried. <clears throat> Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Really informative. <laughs> what about work on alternatives like alternative eggs or egg proteins or substitutes? Have you looked into, is there any work around that uh, in Greece, Stathy? Uh, Sophia, I haven't looked at that. Sorry, mm. uh, I, I don't know. The, everything that I can say, it's. Um, yeah. mm. uh, I have worked on alternative diets for the animals yes. that they produce by all these labs, but not on alternative uh, meat production. That would be a fascinating project. Yeah. Uh, I but I, I haven't looked on, on that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, if anyone else would like to pose a question. Uh, just just to, to mention something like that. Sure. I was uh, on a panel um, with a leading uh, scientist, one of those that um, uh, I was interviewing in one of the labs mm -hmm. and uh, really uh, plays an important role in uh, acetizing uh, several products. Mm -hmm. And he has a whole agenda of uh, the agri-food sector. Actually, he was uh, also leading the uh, National uh, Research and Innovation Council about agri-food. And um, the discourse that those scientists, they develop as alternative pathway, it, was it is not uh, reducing meat production, but change production of uh, meat from chicken or pork to uh, sheep, to lamb. Because lamb, it is based, lamb production is based on Greek races, so Greek breeds, uh, not industrialized production. So, it, this kind of meat consumption, it is legitimized as an alternative consumption pattern and practice, which, which is interesting. Huh? Very because interesting. Yeah. It is within the whole issue of national identity, national production, local production, biodiversity, mm -hmm. without really questioning the rules of the agri-food regime in a way. Mm -hmm. And also sheep production is nomadic. So you can see how uh, region, regional, local, and also the issue of increasing something that we can produce based on um, race, uh, Greek races, is promoted as a different and alternative way of uh, of uh, pathway in in meat production and consumption i don't know i i i hope that i have replied to you yeah interesting 
this emphasis I see also on animal welfare coming out or the idea of animal welfare, I guess, with the chickens being able to be free, um, freely ranging to some extent freely. Um, and now that you're talking about also lamb as not being industrialized, so would you say that sort of that's an issue that has been highlighted more than emissions coming from meat production, climate emissions or climate and uh, meat production? Um, look, from, from interview that we have done uh, in the uh, pork, uh, in the uh, pork production uh, communities and also chicken production communities and also overall uh, big stakeholders, it is clear that the issue of emission is not a big uh, pressure for, for uh, stakeholders. The issue of uh, animal welfare, as I have shown, um, it is a pressure that it is enforced practically. Um, but still, still, uh, the 70% of egg production in Greece, it is from enriched uh, rearing system. So animal, uh, the pressure for animal well-being has been selected in a very specific way for the reasons that I provided. So uh, this paternalistic political culture, but also the vested interest, but also um, the lack of a movement. Huh? The movement has a story uh, in Greece of uh, less than 10 years and not of a, such a strong uh, voice. Uh, in Greece, as in other countries, and this was uh, acknowledged and has been acknowledged uh, by actors of the movements, not my, uh, let's say, uh, explanation. Uh, it is a discourse that the movement also uh, develops. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Statis. It was really nice to hear. Um, it was impressive how deep, depth, how deep you went and also so broad. <laughs> so uh, I learned a lot and um, I hope I, I understood everything. So my comment or my question, I hope it's um, relevant for your presentation. But I was really impressed by this last part that is these virtual prosumers this uh, towards the end of your presentation and transition, and particularly with the with the idea that I, that uh, for me it was uh, quite strong. It is connected to this uh, um, now uh, the possibility to even create representation of consumers. <laughs> So I was really amazed by that. So if so, this idea of that is not new. I, I'm of course the, the, all this uh, consumption is always trying to shape and create identities of consumers. Uh, so uh, I was just uh, I'll say sh shocked <laughs> if I can say this word that this is even brought now for uh, chickens and how to feed the chickens from the production to the consumer and how actually even create profiles of consumers in the in the in the shaping the, the the chickens and their nutrition and their values whatever is being uh, uh, disclaimed so i was i mean it's not really a question i was just uh, i found that uh, because you know identity here again is a strong uh, is a strong uh, component right uh, and uh, this was particular mention that is more urbanized, let's say, uh, um, uh, connected. But with the virtual uh, world, it doesn't have to be necessarily only in the urbanized niche, can be in any parts of the of the location, right? So uh, this, this scares me, if I can say this, how distant we are even more to each other uh, <laughs> as a community 
and also to the animal uh, uh, in this case. So this uh, this uh, um, representation of consumers who define us as consumers, it was really, yeah, uh, extreme for me. I, I mean, just to say this and thank you so much. It was really interesting. Thank you for uh, your comments, uh, Sylvia. Uh, just a brief, um, I would like to just briefly mention that uh, this, um, uh, let's say, uh, project of urban uh, poultry production, as they say, um, it is a pilot project. So, uh, but it is an attempt to redefine and reconfigure sustainable chicken, first of all. The second is that I, when I came across this initiative, which lasts the, the last five years um, as a pilot scheme and then as a company now, um, for me, it was very important, the notion of virtual witness. So it was clear there by interviewing those people that created credibility of something sustainable from a distance, so you don't need to be there. Okay, you can you can visit, let's say, one Sunday with your kids, but practically, what really uh, create credibility is not a, a certificate. It is the virtuality, the ability to survey the coop. So your coop and to survey at a distance. So for me, it remind me my. Uh, in, immediately, I uh, went back to the whole issue, the literature about virtual uh, witnessing, science, technology, the whole shaping and suffer that went back to the 17th century. But suddenly, you have the issue of credibility through virtual witnessing, credibility about sustainable production. Huh? without discourse about organic and stuff like that. So only the linkage with uh, local uh, plants, uh, aromatic plants of the uh, of Greece and the, the region, and then emphasis that you can monitor. And the whole issue of surveillance is something that really, starting from there, now I'm trying to develop a little bit. I don't know if it is so um, easy um, to, uh, to understand also all these technologies that uh, they, uh, they introduce in the, uh, even in the industrial farming about surveillance technologies. So there is a transformation also of the farmer uh, there, of a virtual farmer, that can control the coop and intervene. So uh, virtuality changes also the producer, but also uh, the consumer for sure. That's my feeling, or at least something emerging. There is a, something emerging there. Just to interject here, and I, I think this is also interesting because it's the witnessing and it's also this kind of, you know, this kind of, um, journalism basically uh, investigative journalism that goes in the farm and discloses like shows you what's happening in the farm so it's like taking on appropriating these tools to show you what's going on in the farm and a lot of farmers are doing that by sharing what they're doing on social media and it's it's like uh, using the same techniques that have been used to critique them to show that the work that they're doing is good. This is like, show how you shave the sheep, for example, one of our partners to show that they're not bleeding or they're not unhappy. So, so it's also uh, using the same media or techniques um, for a different purpose, right? So um, so I think that's also super interesting. Um, that's that's fantastic um, comment. I really like that. I haven't thought about that, and that's why it's oh, that's nice, very nice. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I like it. Yes. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I think we have to just uh, wrap up. It's so great to have you here, and uh, I'm so happy you're contributing to this book that we're also editing. And uh, yeah, so uh, looking forward to contribute to sort of working with you more and 
We also have a special issue coming up as well in uh, animals that we are co-editing with Stathis and Aris with Cookies. And uh, yeah, so um, join us next week. Next Wednesday, we already have a, a webinar from Marco Olivier de Plot, who asked the first question. He's working on pork uh, production in France. And uh, yeah, see you next week. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, yes, Sophia. Exactly. Thank you very much, thank you. Uh, everybody. And yes, really. thank you, everyone, for your great questions and yeah, contributions. Sure. Yes. Bye. Bye. Sophia, so hard to believe. Και εγώ πάρα πολύ στάθη μου. Ελπίζω να πήγε καλά. Νομίζω πήγε τέλεια. Πολύ, Ήταν πολύ, πολύ, ωραία. Ωραία. πολύ ενδιαφέρον. Πολύ ενδιαφέρον όπω είπε και η Σίλβια. Πολύ ωραίο. Πολύ καλό. <laughs> Πρέπει να, να μιλήσουμε γενικότερα για το έχουμε ξαναπεί. Μόλι έρθει, πάρε με ε, να τα πούμε.